So let's hope that this isn't a complete waste of time. When I did the Harry Potter, well, I say did. When I started the Harry Potter series, I had good intentions and it failed miserably because of this new thing going around. Who knows what that was? To make up for that, I decided to do the Back to the Future series, which completed it. Took a bit extra time, but I did complete it. We also did Seven Deadly Rejects twice. We did the first Halloween, which went great before Harry Potter. And then we did Seven Deadly Rejects 2, which went smoothly. And now I've decided to talk about quite possibly the most popular, the most beloved franchise in history. No one say the MCU, otherwise you're getting a smack in the cheek. The reason why I say it's the most beloved because it's gone on for decades. And yes, I know, it's had a rough couple of decades. But we can all agree, it's still beloved. It's probably the most well-known franchise when it comes to film in history. So we're going to do it in order of them being released. Just kidding. This is actually the fourth film of the series. But it's episode one. This is all due to George Lucas, the creator of the whole series. And one thing we're going to agree on when we do this season is that George Lucas is a bit of a dickhole. Welcome everyone to Rejected, where we either reject or rejoice in all things everything, and this season we are doing Star Wars The Rejected Saga. We are doing a 12 part season, this is obviously episode 1, The Phantom Menace, and I cannot wait. And if I was going to tell you ladies and gentlemen, that I've been planning this since last August, I wouldn't be lying. You see, when I was getting through Back to the Future, I started coming up with multiple ideas from covering my favourite Disney film and its franchises to my favourite horror film, Banking on December being all about my favourite director. However, I shot those ideas down the moment Star Wars came into my mind. Because there's so much to go through, what would you do? The TV series? The films? What would I go for? Would I just stick to the cringy part of Star Wars like a lot of people have done? Or would I go for something more traditional? Would I go for the films? Would I go for the TV series? What would I do? I'm going to go for the saga that the whole franchise is built on. The Skywalkers. I said there's 12 parts to this season. There's only 9 films in the Skywalker saga. What's the other three? You're going to have to find out those on yourself. But if you have any guesses of what they might be, comment them down below. But I shot everything else down the moment Star Wars came into my mind. When I got around to thinking about Christmas with my favourite director as being the theme of the season, I started thinking about stuff I watch at Christmas. And growing up, one of the main things was Star Wars. The other was Crocodile Dundee. That was always on <laughs> and I don't know why so I dress up like a Shayla. but after that every other idea shut down bye bye gone don't care we're going with Star Wars so I started getting working on the graphics I got the name for it. everything was going fine with it Star Wars the rejected saga coming up with different episodes all the things what am I gonna do I don't know what am I a bitch and I decided 
fuck it. Just go with the films. They're the ones that people are going to get most upset about if you talk about them in a bad way. But, go with the films. So, what are we going to talk about? I mean, let's be honest with each other. These films touch a nerve in a lot of people. So to analyse it, you must either be really brave or really stupid. And I'm both, baby. So, a couple of months after, I have my plan. I've got the nine films in the Skywalker saga, and that left three. I decided to go with 12 because I could plan on getting the rejected saga out once a month, maybe, and maybe slip another rejected in somewhere underneath that, or I don't know. It was just an idea, or I don't know. We might see, we might rush it. It depends on how well we do. So, with all 12 parts all lined up, let's talk about The Phantom Menace. George Lucas had found a huge success thanks to the original Star Wars trilogy, and the audience were always growing, and because of this, Georgie thought, I know what I'll do, I'll make more. Unfortunately for Georgie, he actually finished the season in a brilliant way. It was a nice, happy-dappy ending, and you couldn't top it or beat it, so what the hell were you gonna do? So Georgie thought, I guess you're right. Let's go backwards. And that was that. There would now be a new series of prequels about our beloved characters, and fans couldn't wait to witness their Star Wars back on the screen. But what would this first instalment of our origin story be about? How would it go? What would it be? What would it be like? While fans were questioning this, George was pointing his creative card down a lot. He also surrounded himself with a lot of yes men that were just there to go, yes George, that was fine, instead of challenging his creative ideas like he had with the original three, which led to our story being, two Jedis are about to become acquainted with the most evil villain in all of movie history. Jar Jar Binks. Now, he has his time later on. We will get to Jar Jar. Do not worry. We will get to Jar Jar Binks. Two Jedis escape a trap, but in doing so, meet a young boy by the name of Anakin Skywalker. Jedi Master Qui-Gon is convinced that this boy may just be the answer to a prophecy, bringing balance to the Force, but with the presence of a new enemy by the name of Darth fucking Maul, sorry, Darth Maul, it would seem that an old enemy of the Jedi is about to be unleashed all over again, and the Sith return. So there it is, there's our plot. And to be honest with you, it sounds alright, it's the origin story of our main villain, our main characters following in, and it looks like it could be good. So, when George saw the drafts for the film that he had created with 100% his ideas and all the yes men around him and no one challenging him, I'm sure George Lucas had managed to get lightning in a bottle because it was his mind that created the original three and it had nothing to do with having other people challenging him and pushing him saying hey maybe not this but maybe that go with this how about that and this time it was all george and yes men so george what did you think of phantom menace the first time you saw it i may have gone too far in a few places huh never mind that now that was the final draft george george you've done your bit george it's too late now that's the finished film. That's the film going to cinemas. So George, give the fans what you wanted. So as fans sat idly waiting in a cinema, this was going to be their Star Wars returning. Let's have a look at what they got. We begin with our two Jedi's landing, Master Qui-Gon and his Padawan, Obi-Wan Kenobi. They are there to negotiate with the Trade Federation Viceroy, Newt Gunray. But the Sith Lord Darth Sidious suspected a plan. They suspected that something's afoot. So, Darth Sidious, take it away. Kill them immediately. He orders the death of these Jedi's. And I can't really be the only one that hears this song when these guys Roll on the screen. Rolling around at the, speed of the opening already shows you that this film is moving fast. There's a lot of talking, talking, next scene, talky, talky, next scene, talky, talky, next scene, talky, talky, next scene, talky, talky, next scene. There's no pace to this. It's trying to fit too much so soon. George, 
you've got other films to go with as well. You've got more sequels for it, so... Mm -hmm. And here he is. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen. Jar, Jar, fecking Binks. Mr. Kodjad and Binks. He has been banished by his own people. And do you wonder why? Well, you should find a meal out today. Oh, uh, 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 you never edit on a shot. But with this, it's one shot, and then it just goes, boop. And then there's Jar Jar. It looked weird. We reach the underwater city of Otogunga, where we meet Boss Nass. Who is very... <laughs> That's what I thought, too. I strongly agree with him there. I, yeah, yeah. What? I've already got a headache when it comes to Jar Jar, ladies and gentlemen. He's, uh... He's pushing his luck. Okay, okay, I'm not gonna lie to you, ladies and gentlemen. I've already lost count about how many scenes we've already been through, and we're like 20 minutes into the film? I mean, you were lost trying to get me to sympathise with Jar Jar Binks. You could fuck off right there. But it's losing pace, and it's bad. But fuck all that, because after they save Queen Amidala, they become under attack by the blockade. And that's okay. A little droid saves them all. Little R2D2. So awesome to see that little fucker. Do you know what R2D2 needs? Fucking ball. I'll drop you to it for Nima time. And after another pointless scene with Jar Jar, uh -huh. can we please turn him into a can of fucking sardines? We land on the planet Tatooine, or as I like to call it, Western Superman. Qui Gon with the Queen's handmade Padme and Jar Jar, fuck's sake, go into a settlement of Mos Espa for parts. And they meet Watto, who is... <laughs> yeah, to be fair, I like Watto. A lot of people don't. And a young boy by the name of Anakin Skywalker. I bet he's a secondary character. He's not going to be important to the story. More, 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 more comedy with Jar Jar. Oh. And we are introduced to a new droid. C-3PO. Human cyborg relations. And we learn that Anakin's building a racer. I bet those skills will come in handy later on. And now we have our villain for the film. This is my apprentice, Darth Maul. This guy looks good. He can kick ass. And ladies and gentlemen, he is fucking awesome. I have a suspicion we're going to see him a lot through the next three films. <laughs> but this is where we first sense that something is about this kid. There's something going on, and Qui-Gon is spending a little too much time walking around with this young boy. He even takes a blood sample at one point. Uh, Qui-Gon, you didn't even ask his mummy if you could do that. Qui-Gon has a feeling that this boy is the chosen one. A prophecy where it builds together a balance between the light side and the dark side of the Force. And this is why he is very happy to wager with Watto. Should Anakin lose the race, Watto keeps the ship. But should he win, Watto gives him the parts for the ship along with Anakin's freedom. Qui-Gon, why do you want that small boy? But while Qui-Gon wonders, Darth Maul has just arrived on Tatooine. It's the day of the race. Everyone's excited. And to be fair to you, when everyone talks about this film, it's one of their most favorite scenes. I mean, don't get me wrong, the effects on this scene are pretty impressive for the time and they still hold up today. But seeing Jabba the Hutt, Makes everyone go, ah, yay. <laughs> oh look, there's Warwick Davis. He's not wearing fur or a silly outfit. So the race begins with a little bit of sabotage. <laughs> Anakin makes progress. This part of the film is enjoyed by a lot of fans and I think it was made for a lot of the fans. Definitely not extended for any type of video game release. Not at all, couldn't have been. This, 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 this scene goes on for a while. But it would seem after a few mistakes and accidents, Anakin Skywalker wins the race. Hey. And his freedom. Hey. But not his mother's. Oh. Where do you want me to put my thumb? This is already planting the seeds brilliantly, and I can't wait to see how much it develops from here. But this is where we do need to talk about the quality of the graphics, especially in the race scene. They look great, but some of the green screens in the pods, they aren't the best. I mean, even the original trilogy of Star Wars films kind of still look good, but you can't say that this wasn't impressive. <laughs> so they've got the parts of the ship, uh, they've got Anakin, 
The Queen's just sat on the ship. She's been chilling, you know. I mean, it's not like a Sith's gonna drop in and start fighting them outside the ship. And they can drop! Oh well, fuck me for a bag of beans. Darth Maul and his lightsaber. More on that later, because his lightsaber is... Oof. But for now, a meeting that would mean a lot more than expected. Anakin Skywalker, meet Obi-Wan Kenobi. Retrospectively though, what's that age difference do you think? But we land on Coruscant, and oh look, Senator Palpatine is waiting there. Oh, he must be lovely, Senator Palpatine. Oh, he's so caring, isn't he? I mean, he's such a little boy. Just kidding, he's convinced Amadella to call for a vote of no confidence in the Chancellor Valorum. This is going to be interesting. Oh look, it's Jules Winfield. Does he look like a bitch? Sorry. And with this vote of no confidence against Valorum, Senator Palpatine is nominated. This could make things interesting. Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan are sent with Amidala back to Naboo in order to end the Federation's control and the Jedi Council have denied Anakin's training. Spooky. They brought him all that way for nothing. And he's free now, so they're just going to abandon him and just go, kids, feck off. Yeah. I mean, Qui-Gon's quite convinced that this boy is the chosen one and he's saying he will go against the Council to train the boy. But he's been told no. Qui-Gon. Be an audio boy now. And it would seem we are in our final act of the film. Jar Jar will get the Gungans help. There's a nobody there. Probably. And Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan will turn their focus to not only protecting the Queen, but to the Sith who has been hot on their trail. But when Padme reveals herself as the true Queen, and the Queen there is a decoy, this convinces the Gungans to team up and to take down the Federation. <laughs> So the lines are drawn. The droids and the Federation on the one hand, and the Gungans, Jedis, and the Guards on the other. While the Gungans distract the droids, the Jedis and the Guards will go into the capital and capture the Viceroys. Sounds like a plan. Hope it goes well. Just as long as they don't put an idiot in charge of the Gungans. We shall make you bombard general. The battle happens in the capital, and while the Queen sends out pilots to take out the droid ships, Anakin has to find a place to hide. Oh, just, just try to hide in that thing. Why is he hiding in the cockpit? And why is Qui-Gon okay with him hiding in the cockpit? <laughs> and here we go. Darth Maul has made his presence clear, and a battle like no other will take place, with a song that is so iconic to any of the Star Wars fans. But for legal reasons, I can't play it, therefore, um... <laughs> but after watching this scene, and maybe the rest of the film, for the next day... I'm going around the house going... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But is that a fish eye lens on that shot? Because it looks weird. That shot does not look pleasant. It looks like they've pulled the camera as far back as possible just to get that shot. It looks off-putting. I don't like it. Stop it. Oops. Anakin's now flying in the ship. That's fucked. But as we've seen, we've already know he's got quite good piloting skills with the race, so his skills should come in handy. Oh, fuck my dad's friend called Jim. Anyway, the battle between the Jedi and the Sith rages on in one awesome scene that can't be denied. The anticipation builds, and it's not looking good for our heroes, and Obi-Wan can only... Can only? And Obi-Wan can only look on as Darth Maul wins this round, striking down Qui-Gon. <laughs> With the Viceroy seemingly captured, Obi-Wan Kenobi stands as the last one fighting on the planet below as the starships up high seem to have just found some luck in the form of young Skywalker. What did I say? I told you that skill would be good. With the droids out, the Gungans celebrate, but for Obi-Wan, the fight is not over. And with the Force on his side, Darth Maul is divided. <laughs> Quite literally. And with his last breath, Qui-Gon asks Obi-Wan Kenobi to train Anakin as his new Padawan, to which he promises to do so. Their battle is over, Palpatine is now Supreme Chancellor, and Anakin Skywalker will be trained as a Jedi. But there is one thing left to answer. When it comes to the Sith, there is no more, no less than two. A master and an apprentice. Which leaves the question, which one was killed in Darth Maul? The master or the apprentice? But for now, all is well with the Force. This film was met by very mixed response. On the one hand, it did receive multiple Oscar nominations, probably for the effects, because to be fair, at the time, they were impressive. 
I mean, HD transfers and that probably haven't done the world of good for the film. But saying that, when I watched this version of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original on Blu-ray in its steel case, it was perfect. The quality of the film looked great. And that budget had to be a lot less than fucking Phantom Menace. But on the other hand, the fans were not so happy. But for me, I have to side with the fans. This film is badly paced, and at one moment, it's serious, and the next, Jar Jar is there for comedic effect. Each scene lasts around two to three minutes, or at least feels like it. And then we are thrown into another plot point. The only time I feel like there's genuine effort put into scenes is the pod race and the duel of the fates. Everything else just feels like a, well, this is going to happen. What will happen here? That's that. Let's go there. Let's come here. We're here now. Okay, cool. What are we doing over there? We're going to go over there in a second. Okay, we are over there now. It feels so bad. It's too so fast. Slow the fuck down, Georgie. But now we got to get critical. Because for story, being a prequel, you have to remember that there is a lot of love already in place for these characters. But taking that away, it sets a good precedent of what's to come. And although it may lend itself at times to give the fans a familiar face here and there, the new characters and portrayals are impressive, in some cases. It feels like a book turned into a film, but the book is over 5,000 pages long, so a lot of it is needed to be compressed into a two-hour film. But overall, good. A solid 3.5. I'd have no problem giving it a 3.5 out of 5 for story. But for execution, however, most of the special effects hold up, but you have to remember, George Lucas has had a tendency to go back on his old films and add effects, change things around. So whereas some of the effects are good, a lot of the time, it's down to retouches. But bad pacing has to be a key factor. And for the first time ever in this series, fuck Jar Jar Binks right off. This film is a headache to watch, even with two scenes that are worthy of watching on their own. But it does come with some iconic moments, so a 2.5 out of 5 will have to do for execution. The Phantom Menace gets a 5.5, scraping an average, and it is rejoiced. This film's biggest crimes was killing off its main bad guy. The fans are taken to Darth Maul. What were they thinking? Darth Maul was incredible, and to see him wasted like this, it's just a shame. But for now, the game is in play. A Sith remains, a Jedi in the making, and everything is in motion. But thank you so much for tuning in. This has been the first episode, episode one, Phantom Menace of Star Wars The Rejected Saga. It's been fun. Watching these films again, talking about them, it's going to be such a blast. And it's going to be another season that we complete. You have my fucking guarantee. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, comment down below. If you have any of your thoughts on The Phantom Menace, subscribe if you haven't already, because when you subscribe, you will not miss a single episode of Rejected. You will not miss a single episode of The Brief History. You will not miss a single episode of Never Seen. And a new show is on the horizon. That, that'll come later. But until then, thank you so much for watching. My name's been Ash Lynch, and this, this has been The Phantom Menace. And The Phantom Menace is rejoiced.